Hello and welcome back to the Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be wrapping up Season 4 and looking at how the TV version substantially remixed the starts of the Fear the Hunters arc, which would take place next season. When we left off in the adaptation, the group was still scattered, whereas in the source material, they've already begun their way to Washington DC. And as such, the final stretch of the season, similar to Season 4 in general, will be very different from the books. And with that said, let us dive in. I want to begin by looking at what I honestly think is one of the most overlooked episodes of the season. That being 413 alone, especially with what we talked about last time in regards to the episode still. Instead of the aforementioned bottle episode, this one focuses on a couple of groups, including the duo of Beth and Daryl. The most of all, I want to look at Bob's story, featuring yet another example of The Walking Dead's brilliant soundtrack. That being Blackbird's song by Lee DeWise. As usual, I really recommend giving this one a listen. The Win story, this episode opens with a flashback of how he met the survivors in the length of time between season 3 and 4. At this point, he is just happy not to be alone anymore, though as he himself would later say, it was merely the start of him counting down the days until he was alone again. Though by the end of the episode, we see his story pretty much come full circle, as Blackbird's song plays once again as we see him go off on his own in an attempt to catch up to Maggie on her way to Terminus. Only this time, he is not counting down the days until he loses them again. He has overcome that fear and is actively going after his friend. On top of that, considering that both him and Sasha are almost entirely exclusive to the adaptation, I think their relationship was written really well and made the events that would transpire in early Season 4 much, much more impactful. I know for quite a few people, Bob is still among their favorite characters and I can certainly see why, as he is just a super likable guy. Though in a broader sense, we get to see some interesting locations and settings in this episode as well. Most of all, of course, the super thick fog as well as a couple of nighttime scenes, which you know I'm a fan of. As for Maggie, her role in this episode, as you'd expect, is entirely focused on following any leads that may lead to Glenn. And for me, her character is indisputably better in the adaptation in this particular arc. We'll talk about it more when we get there in the books, but her journey in this episode was just so much more interesting than in the source material. Yes, I'll admit the ending of the episode with the whole I was waiting for you and Bob can seem a little cheesy, though I do feel like it still gets the message across of her realizing that she can't find him alone and that this blind pursuit will only get her killed. So she grows and begins to understand that she is not the only one who has lost something, with Sasha still having no idea whether Tyrese is alive either. And finally, before we pick up the books, we still have the duo of Daryl and Beth to talk about. Their story in this episode is very much a continuation from the episode still. They come across this house that is suspiciously stocked with supplies, and in a manner that is very very rare for Daryl, we see him open up to Beth quite a bit. For me personally, this episode worked much better than still for quite a few reasons. Number one is that it's not entirely focused on the duo, so the setting and their dynamic just didn't get stale. But number two is that this episode felt much more like a classic apocalypse type of story. They hold up in a house, talk about whether there are any good people left and the general state of the world, and as you'd expect, all of that is ripped away as the reality of the walker threat floods in, sending them running once again. Yes, there is a little bit less of that introspective narrative. Though broadly speaking, I think this episode does a better job of balancing the general excitement of the episode and those character-centric stories. Though returning to the episode, this is the nighttime shoot I was talking about before, and again, Nothing is as classic zombie apocalypse as a walker attack in a graveyard, right? Though importantly for Daryl, during this attack, Beth is taken by a mysterious car, answering the question of why the house was stocked with supplies. It was bait. Later, we'd find out that she was taken by Dawn's police group, but as of right now, we just see Daryl desperately trying to chase her down, but obviously not being able to catch up. 
much of this, especially him finally opening up to a person only to have them ripped away, is setting up his arc later in Season 5, so for now, just keep that in mind. And finally, Daryl meets Joe and the Claimers, though unlike Rick's initial meeting, it's clear that, in many ways, he fits in very well with the bunch, so for now, they ally up. And, like I said at the very top of the video, due to the extreme difference in circumstances, every single thing we just talked about is TV show exclusive. And so with that, let us finally pick up the books. To very quickly set the scene, the group is out on the road, so basically everything we'll be talking about here, is when they camp out for the night, or something like that. The first thing to bring up is a nightmare that Rick has, where Carl runs out of the house and is almost hit by a car. There's really not too much to read into here, it's obviously just Rick thinking about how they're on the edge of death pretty much all the time now, and connecting that to Carl almost being run over back in the normal world. Though the next scene is the more interesting one, as Rick heads back into the house and sees Lori. She calms him down, but as they go to kiss, she turns into a walker right in front of him, and begins to say that he can't protect Carl, just like he couldn't protect her, etc, etc. The nightmare ends with Rick saying that she is right, and that he deserves all of this. And while this scene was sort of emulated in that deleted scene back in Season 3, the overall purpose of it, at least in my opinion, is much, much different. I'd pretty much describe these events as Rick hitting rock bottom in terms of his confidence in being a father and a leader, following which many events of this arc will work toward re-establishing him as the leader, though more on this in just a little bit. After he wakes up from the nightmare in the middle of the night, he goes to take over the watch and begins to talk on the phone. Just like I talked about in the previous parts, I think this aspect of Rick's coping mechanism is handled much better in the books, as it pretty much just vocalizes his inner dialogue, instead of being this cryptic personality that, after Rick learns is merely his imagination, is pretty much forgotten. The next morning, while the group is moving through a town, we get another pretty interesting moment that we didn't really get a lot of in the adaptation. That being Eugene investigating the walkers they come across. This was just another instance of us being sort of coerced into believing that Eugene does indeed know what he claims to know. There are of course plenty of times where he does flex his intelligence in the adaptation as well, though I feel like this early on, that part of him is a little more pronounced in the books. The following night, we get to what I brought up before with Maggie. Since this is YouTube, as usual, I will have to dance around talking about it. But Glenn stumbles into the forest after being worried that Maggie has been gone for too long. Only to find her... you know. She is promptly cut down, obviously sending Glenn into absolute grief. Though yes, I don't know if this is just me or what, but knowing where her character would end up, this just doesn't seem like Maggie. You can obviously argue that this sort of thing is realistic, but for me, I far prefer the I will find Glenn if it's the last thing I do type of vibe simply because I feel like it gives Maggie much more of a centric role in her own sort of sub arc. And that does not really happen in the books. Though another issue that stems from this event is that Abraham and Rick begin to butt heads straight away. As Abe says that she has to be put down before she turns. Rick, on the other hand, pulls a gun on him and tells him to chill out and let Glenn grieve. And again, notice how Rick is already slowly returning to his leadership position. As aside from Glenn, he is the only one who stands up to Abe right away. Though all of this comes to a boiling point once Maggie catches a breath and Abraham realizes what he almost did. Though despite sort of thanking Rick for stopping him before he could pull the trigger, he tells him to never pull a gun on him. Only for Rick to respond that the next time he points a gun at him, he will pull the trigger and just calmly walks away. So yeah, when push comes to shove, you can already see that Rick is essentially coming back into that leadership position. Though the next day, when Rick has a run-in with a walker and Abraham saves him, Rosita finds him shaking and asking what is wrong. 
And Abraham then explains that no one talks to him like Rick does and that it's driving him mad and begs her to stop him from killing again. Of course, all of these disputes between Rick and Abe are by default moved to season 5. Though, as is sort of trend for the series at this point, Abraham will be more important in the books than he is in the adaptation. And as such, we will get more of his backstory when he himself tells it to Rick. And you'll see exactly what I mean in just a few short minutes. Following this point, the adaptation sort of remixed the order of events somewhat. So in the book, the events of 414 The Grove in regards to Mika and Lizzie technically happen after the events of the finale, so keep that in mind. We will continue to go chronologically through both versions, so you should see what I mean. Though with that said, let us get into the aforementioned focus episode on the small group consisting of Carol, Tyrese, Judith, and the sisters Lizzie and Mika. This episode primarily focuses on two storylines. One that started way back in the prison when Karen and David were killed, and the other, Lizzie's very messed up worldview. As you'd expect, the whole Carol coming clean about being the one who killed Karen is entirely exclusive to the adaptation. Whereas Lizzie's storyline is an altered version of Ben's from the comic book, which is why I said to just think of them interchangeably for now. Just to keep things simple, we'll address the comic book version when we come to it, but broadly speaking, very similar events happen. Lizzie, or Ben, are terribly confused as to how the world works and kill their sibling and are then put down, just because they are incredibly dangerous to everyone around them. In the TV version, that is even more pronounced, as Lizzie calmly says that Judith is right there, and she was supposed to be the next one, so that is very, very messed up. Though soon after, we get the very infamous line of just look at the flowers, Lizzie, as Carol once again steps up and does what is necessary for their survival. As we've talked about quite a few times in the series already, Carol's character in the adaptation has been built up as a super hardened fighter ever since losing Sophia in season 2. And similarly, here she's given a different character's plot element to make that even more pronounced. As after seeing her do something like this, basically anything, no matter how twisted it may be, should seem very much in character for her. Returning to the book, as I alluded to before, the story takes a much different turn. We arrive at an intersection and once again opinion is split on where they should go. Rick says that they should go north, as they could swing by his hometown and raid the police station that only he has access to. This was sort of emulated back in 312 Clear, when they returned there with the explicit goal of getting weapons to fight the governor. Though, this will be a little bit different. Abraham, on the other hand, says that they should go east, as that will get them to Washington faster. Though he is convinced once Rick assures him that it would be a worthwhile detour for the guns and supplies alone since it's not really that far. And so, Rick, Abraham and Carl get in a car and drive off while the others set up camp. Though before we continue on this plot thread, let us catch up on the adaptation, starting with Abe's group. First off, Eugene's interactions with Tara in this episode are simply perfect. Just how candidly Josh McDermott delivers every line as Eugene is on point. Though in story, this is when Glenn finally sees the signs left by the trio of Maggie, Bob and Sasha, prompting him to throw all caution to the wind and try to get there as soon as he can. And it's here where we get one of the most legendary things to ever come out of Abraham's mouth. Him not giving a monkey's left nut about it being barely noon and that they're stopping. Though Glenn says that he'll give up his riot gear and keep on going, so for now, they split off from Abe's group. Personally, similar to what we just talked about with Maggie, I feel like these changes just give Glenn more agency than he ever had in the source material. So with that said, I would consider these as fairly successful additions. Meanwhile, Daryl is getting accustomed to the Claimer's way of living. Since their group was very short-lived, I don't think there's too much point getting into it here, though as far as minor villains go, I think they are among my favorites that appear in the series. Frankly, I think the line from Joe about Daryl is still a brilliant description of his character. Ain't nothing sadder than an outdoor cat that thinks he's an indoor cat. This single line encompasses much of Daryl's story this season. 
In the prison, he had finally grown used to having people around and a place to call home. Then once that was destroyed, he still found hope in his friendship with Beth. But that too was ripped away and he was thrown back into his natural element for, lack of a better word, being a feral cat. And Joe, being one himself, can pretty clearly see that the reason why Daryl is stumbling around as if he had no goal other than simply to survive is because he had grown accustomed to thinking that he is indeed an indoor cat. And one last thing, Joe's reaction to seeing the Terminus posters is one that, at least for me, really leaves me theorizing about what could have been. After seeing the whole sanctuary part, he just calmly says that it's nonsense and that there's no such thing as sanctuary, prompting the question of, is Rick and the rest of the group gullible for following the tracks? What if Shane was around, would he have believed it? Among many other interesting questions about alternate scenarios. Though yes, for a group that appears in like 3 or 4 episodes, I think they were a decently interesting bunch. Returning to Abe's group, Eugene has pulled some shenanigans and tricked the group into following Glenn. And while this is a comparatively small change, just like with Glenn and Maggie, I think it just gives him a little bit more agency than he had in the source material. Aside from his short bursts of big brain energy, he is mostly in the background. So I think him being a tad more fleshed out in the adaptation was a great decision. Though their story culminates as Glenn and Tara are stuck in this tunnel and are overrun by walkers, only to be saved in the nick of time by the combined groups of Abe and Maggie. The highlight here is of course the reunion of Glenn and Maggie that had been building up for the latter half of this season. And finally, with what is in hindsight a song that provides a pretty extreme juxtaposition, be not so fearful plays as the group arrives at Terminus. As for the comic books, after the trio left for Rick's hometown, we see them camped out for the night and Abraham staying watch. That is, until they are ambushed by a small group and held at gunpoint. They threaten Carl, which throws Rick into a brutal rage. And the famous scene happens as he bites and rips out one of their throats, completely stunning the others by the sheer brutality. One of them is promptly shot by Abraham, while the other, while begging for mercy, is chased down and ripped apart by Rick. This is of course very close to what happens in the adaptation, only this is not some random small group, but the claimers getting revenge for one of their own, who Rick killed way back in 411. Also, if you want to keep count, this is Rick's first major rampage in his infamous murder jacket. Though the primary difference is for the adaptation is that 1. There's more people in Joe's group and they are in fact familiar with Rick. 2. Instead of Abraham, it's Michonne who's with Rick. And 3. The fact that Daryl is alongside the claimers. The following morning is also very very different between the two. In the source material, after Abraham witnessed what Rick is capable of, they talk about how you can never come back from something like that. And then Abraham begins to cry saying that he should tell Rick about how he lost his family. His story is very very messed up so I can't really recite it to you here, but the gist of it is that Abraham lost his family and had to put them down, including a baby girl. He then shot three more people because they were stealing from them, and as time went on he realized that it was far too easy and that it didn't even upset him. Which is obviously something that makes him scared of what he himself is capable of. After hearing this, Rick tells him how he ran over Martinez with the RV, and assures him that he just did what had to be done. They're both killers, but not because they want to be. And just as he says, if Carl were to know about the things I did, Carl says, I shot a man in the neck. That, of course, being Shane. And he then tells Rick that he saw everything that happened and that he didn't look away. He wanted to help. This will be massively important for what's to come very, very shortly, so keep this in mind. But all in all, this was a crucial moment in developing the mutual respect Rick and Abraham would have for each other. That was both altered, since this moment does not really happen, and was moved far later into the adaptation. And as is pretty much trend with Daryl, much of the plotlines that are cut from characters like Tyrese or Abe here, are given to him. 
So in the adaptation, it's not much more than them just strengthening their bond as Rick calls him his brother. And this little sentence will become very important far, far later into the series. So just keep in mind that this is the first time where he calls him his brother. As for Carl, in the adaptation, he doesn't join the conversation or anything like that. Instead, he has a conversation with Michonne, where she explains in just how dark of a place she was, and how Rick and him brought her back from that. So put briefly, instead of emphasizing Carl becoming more hardened and getting even closer to Rick, Michonne is focused on to establish her as a motherly role to him. They did try to squeeze in some aspects of Carl having his darker side in the adaptation, but in my humble opinion, it really didn't work or actually lead anywhere, as he never really showed any of that in later seasons. Returning to the books, they arrive back in Rick's hometown, where Rick is suddenly bonked over the head with a shovel a la issue 1. And we get to see Morgan. Similar to the adaptation, his son was bit and turned, though in the books, Morgan also killed people and fed them to the zombified Duane. So in both versions, he is pretty messed up when we meet him. Though once Rick tells him to let Duane rest, he can't put him down and instead shoots the chain and lets him roam free. Also unlike the adaptation where he stayed behind, he joins the group straight away, and they head over to the police station together. Morgan's a bit of a weird case when it comes to the two different versions, as in many ways, they are very very similar. While in others, he is completely and utterly different. Though I suppose getting into it now is not entirely relevant, as there will be a few events in the book that will illustrate that better in just a little bit, so for now, just keep that in mind. After they loot the police station, just as they had planned, they get ready to return to the group right away. But on the way back, they run into what in the comic book is the first ever full-on horde. Just like we talked about in the previous parts, we had never yet seen anything close to this in the story. And unlike some of the hordes we've seen in the TV version, this one plays a crucial role in pretty much everything that comes next. They fight their way through the horde and just try to outrun it as much as they can so they can give a heads up to the rest of the group. Though before Rick's group gets back, we see that Dale and Andrea are once again debating splitting off from the group as they think settling down would be safer for the twins and Dale is in no shape to constantly be on the move either. This is what I brought up briefly in the previous parts. Despite the group being very, very small, we do still see them debating whether they should indeed be following Rick and Abraham. In the adaptation, on the other hand, this is more so done on an individual level, like we saw with Glenn or Maggie. It's obviously not super important, but like we've seen throughout the latter half of the season, it does allow for a little bit more development for these characters in the adaptation, since they themselves are making the decisions. As Rick's group returns, however, it becomes clear that if they don't move, the Horde will just stomp all over them regardless of how much they try to avoid it. For the next while, it's pretty much portrayed as this giant death wave that the group has to constantly put at a manageable distance while still being able to scavenge supplies along the way. And so with that, once again the group, including Dale and Andrea, is forced back on the road. Though later that night once they camp out, Ben and Billy disappear for a bit and Andrea goes to look for them. Only to discover Ben sitting over his brother with a knife and calmly saying, Don't worry, he's going to come back. I didn't hurt his brains. If you haven't read the books, it should now be fairly clear why I likened them to Lizzie and Mika as they essentially play out identically here. Though the major difference comes in what follows after. Unlike the TV version where it's only Carol and Tyrese around, in the books it's everyone chiming in on what they should do. Many ideas are thrown around, including locking them up etc. Though it's Abraham who says that everyone knows what needs to be done. Things obviously get heated as no one here is willing to do it, but all of that is interrupted as a man carrying a Bible appears. That, of course, being Gabriel. So once again, due to the substantial remixes involved around Terminus, his introduction is comparatively sooner than in the adaptation. 
Though very similar to the TV version, everyone is skeptical of his claims that he doesn't even carry around a weapon or anything. But the promise of a church with supplies does seem appealing enough for the group to take a detour. So that now becomes the plan for the next couple of days. Though as night falls, we see Carl sneak out of his tent and head over to the van where Ben is being held. As he opens the doors, we see Ben ask him, are you scared of me? Only for Carl to respond, no, as we cut to Rick waking up from a gunshot. But by the time everyone has gotten up and went to see what happened, Carl has already returned to the tent with the only person seeing him being Morgan. And straight away, I far, far prefer how the comic book deals with this plotline. This on top of him killing Shane way back in Atlanta should go a long ways to showing just how different the two versions of his character are already. I've always felt like Carl's character in the adaptation was the closest to his comic book counterparts in the season 3 finale, when he shot that guy who was supposedly giving up his gun. Though that was immediately pulled back as both he and Rick adopted the more laid back lifestyle in early season 4. Only problem is, once we got through that, Rick is catapulted back to being that cold and ruthless leader. Whereas Carl never really progresses past that. He's nowhere as dark and frankly messed up, despite living through very very similar experiences which, as someone familiar with the source material, just feels weird. And I know that it's very popular to say that it was the actor's fault or whatever, but how is the fact that these comic book moments were taken away from him in any way, shape or form the actor's fault? Personally, I think it just comes down to the fact that the writers didn't really have a clear goal where the character should go because Chandler was far older. A 16 year old stepping up and taking out the threat to the group is nowhere near as impactful as a 9 or 10 year old, right? But this is just one of many instances in the book where we see the direct impact of what Carl has lived through. Just like Rick said, he should keep an eye on the others, and he did. Just like what happened to them on the highway, he didn't look away and did what he thought had to be done. Though again, there will be plenty more of these moments where, for some reason, the TV version chose to adapt certain comic book events one to one, but the impact of them is nowhere near the same level because some of these moments in between are missing. Though as of now, the only person who is aware of what Carl did is Morgan. So with that, Ben is also given a burial and the group once again gets back on the road. That is, until we cut to a view through the trees where two shadowy figures say to get the others, and that they're going to follow them. And, in terms of comic book events, that's where we leave off season 4. No train tracks, no terminus, no reunion, just them heading to Washington and a few shady figures tracking them. In the adaptation on the other hand, the only groups that are still yet to reach Terminus is the trio of Carol, Tyrese and Judith, and Rick's group consisting of Michonne, Carl, Daryl and of course himself. Though only the latter is one who'd actually reach it, so for now, Carol and her gang don't really play into the rest of the season. As for Rick, they still play it somewhat safe and bury some of their supplies in case things go south and sneak in through the back with all their weapons. The interesting thing here is that their weapons are never taken away and they are seemingly welcomed in with absolutely no issues. And I've gotta say, as a comic book reader, I think this was among the most hype moments in the series for me. As, just like the general TV audience, I was going in completely blind. Sure, we were expecting the Hunters to appear sometime soon, but Terminus, at least so far, appeared to be something completely different. So I think it should come as no surprise that I prefer the TV version of the Hunter story by quite a large margin, especially with everything that's yet to come later in Season 5. Seeing the light bulb go off in Rick's mind as he sees the riot gear, the poncho and Herschel's pocket watch was just so so exciting to watch. And then when they figure that they are being led to the train cart, people familiar with the book would immediately realize that these are the hunters. So suddenly the question arises of what chance do they even have of making it out of here alive. It was just a super interesting remix of that part of the comic book story. Though a couple more things to mention here. 
First off, this is yet another instance of the dreaded A appearing. And because I've seen countless people claim to know the meaning of it, I highly doubt that the A in Negan's compound, the A on Rick's hand in Alexandria, the A here in Terminus and later in Season 5 on the church, the A on Rick's helicopter and the container, among some others that I just likely forgot, are connected. They pop up in completely random locations with seemingly absolutely no sense behind them. But at the same time, why paint the A on the church with no meaning if they already drop off Bob to scare them? Why have the A on literally every location where Rick and the gang runs by and the train they're trapped in also be an A? If I'm being totally honest, and yes I know this is a pretty major tangent we've gone on, I wouldn't be surprised if this has just turned into some sort of inside joke among producers or something like that. Because no matter how you swing it, they just don't make sense. Writing them off as you're reading too much into it doesn't really hold due to it being purposely shoved into our faces time after time, but drawing any conclusions from them doesn't really work either since they don't follow absolutely any pattern. But alright, enough about that. The other thing that I wanted to bring up is that this marks the moment where our gang gets some more nicknames. Those being the ringleader, the archer, the samurai, and the kid. This just became a super signature line that, similar to Rick's original nicknames of Officer Friendly and Helicopter Boy, surprisingly never appears in the books, so there's a cool piece of trivia I guess. And the very very last thing to mention, because my voice is already gone, is of course the reunion in the train cart. We see Rick step in, only to see what's left of the prison group already there. Oh, and yes, and this is something that I have heard over the years, if you're being super picky, you can say, wow, that's convenient, but come on, we are watching a zombie apocalypse series, so allow for some suspension of disbelief. Though what's more important here is the final line Rick says that, due to AMC's guidelines, had to be censored and in my opinion, worsened the moment quite a bit. Speaking of which, keep in mind these guidelines around swear words, that'll become more important. Ironically, I will have to censor the line myself, but you can easily find it on YouTube if you want to see the uncensored scene, which I thoroughly recommend. This is a line that is lifted straight out of the comic book when they're talking about the hunters in just a little bit. But yes, I realize that this is a small detail, though for me personally, it being censored did actually detract from the moment on initial viewing. Again, we'll be talking about this much much more when we get to a particular bat-wielding gentleman, but the way guidelines around certain swear words work on US TV has always seemed baffling to me. As where I live, if the program was intended for mature audiences, there were no limitations on what you can and can't say. Whereas in The Walking Dead, certain words were completely fine, but certain weren't. It just never made sense to me. I mean, they're all swear words, and this is not something a child should watch. Though yes, sadly, I do think that, especially later on, it will be a very large downside to the live-action version. But with that, that is Season 4. To very quickly round up where we stand in both versions, in the books, Ben and Billy are both dead, with Ben being put down by Carl, though Morgan has now joined the group when they return to Rick's hometown. And simply due to him being around for much longer, Abraham has already had a lot more development in the books, specifically in relation to Rick. When they get back on the road, they're being tracked by a couple of people who mention that they have a larger group, but as of now, that is all we know. Meanwhile, in the adaptation, everyone aside from Carol, Tyrese, Judith and Beth is captured in Terminus. As of right now, in story, we've got no clue where Beth is, but she was taken by a car marked with a cross. Carol and Tyrese, on the other hand, we know are somewhere in the nearby vicinity of Terminus. And speaking of Carol, after Lizzie killed Mika, she was the one to put her down. But with that said, next time we'll be delving into the much anticipated Fear the Hunters arc and looking at how the TV version massively changed the first act of it with Terminus. How the show produced fake scenes and lied to us to make us think that Terminus isn't actually a group of villains, 
as well as talk about the episode that shattered all records and marked the peak of The Walking Dead's popularity. And that's the video. And since this is the first Walking Dead video of the year, I just wanted to wish you all a happy 2022. Though as always, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these big projects for you all. And speaking of which, let us give a warm welcomes to the newest members of the team, State the Obvious and Julian Pog. Seriously, thank you, thank you. But if you wish to join the highly coveted Mystery Shack Insiders Club, you can do so for as little as one buckaroo per month. And last but not least, let us do the usual secret phrase to see how many of you stuck around until the very, very end. Leave a comment, whatever it may be, and include the words Spooky Hunter. Let's see what you come up with. If you enjoyed the video, please consider sharing it with someone who might enjoy it and do all the YouTube algorithm things. But now, I want to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.